Hello, and welcome to episode one of Writers, Readers, and the Stories We Love. Um, I'm here with Diane Sanchez and our special first guest ever for the series, Nora Anthony. Um, and so we'll, um, first off, I'll just give our participants a chance to um, introduce themselves a little bit and then I'll kick us off. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, if you want to go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Diane and um, I met Josh in Stone Coast and Noah's also from Stone Coast. So even though our paths kind of like <laughs> cross very briefly, um, but I write romance and some YA fantasy, which, and I, that's basically what I read too. So I read what I write. Um, and yeah, I'm from Miami, but I currently live in Nashville. So, yeah. <laughs> And I'm Nora, um, and like Diane just stated, um, I went to Stone Coast, and that's where I met Josh as well. Um, I write fantasy um, and a little sci-fi. Um, basically, um, I dip into anything like speculative, um, and I'm currently in New York. Yeah, and um, for anyone who doesn't know me, um, I'm Josh Gothier. I write sci-fi, fantasy, romance, theater, um, basically anything that I feel like, um, including snarky unicorns and stories about <laughs> dragons, um, which is fun. Um, so really, we put this series together um, just kind of with the idea of getting writers together to talk about writing, but also just um, we read a lot. And so talking about stories, the books we love, um, and really just kind of chatting and having that community. Um, so this is really a chance to do that. Um, I will be monitoring the comments on Facebook. So if you are watching this live, feel free to jump in there with uh, comments, questions, anything like that. There is a brief delay, um, but I will be watching what goes on there. Uh, so feel free to join in the discussion with us. And um, so without further ado, I think we'll jump in. Um, our conversation today is really looking at world building, um, which writers talk about a lot, especially speculative fiction writers. Um, but if you're not as familiar with that term, uh, world building is really just um, writers creating the world of the story. So whether that's a colony on Mars with a new form of government, whether it's a land ruled by dragons, or if it's just the rules of a story set in, um, in the contemporary world. If it's, um, uh, say, a rom-com set in New York versus a uh, gritty thriller, th they're both in New York City, but those are very different worlds with very different rules. And so world building in writing kind of goes into all of that, setting up the story that you're telling um, and really showing the reader what sort of story to expect as well um, for as they are diving in. Um, so I think the first question really to just kind of kick off our discussion, um, is there anything first of all that you would add to that description of world building? And also when you're reading, uh, what is it about an author's world that really tends to draw you in? Um, what piece of, of world building do each of you like? And um, maybe what are some books or authors that you think do it particularly well? Um, I'd say for me, what draws me in um, is like two, well, two things. Um, one, I really enjoy world building that is very efficient, um, that goes um, just along with the plot and the story. Um, like the first thing that comes to mind that I think of is um, The Color Purple. I just finished reading it um, by Alice Walker. And there it's all, um, the whole novel is um, letters from Celie to, um, yeah, just letters to God from Celie. And she uses um, very small details to kind of give you hints to the time period to um, Celie and what her, like her identity. Um, as well as um, just where it's located, um, but it doesn't stop the story from moving and it doesn't um, pull you out or slow down. Um, and I really like that. I really enjoy, um, I guess the efficiency of that, um, where it's like, I'm only getting what I need to know right now and then it's slowly building into something more developed. Um, but I also do love expansive uh, world building. And of course, for me, 
the first thing I think of is um, the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I love, um, I love being immersed in that way as well. Um, specifically, I love like reading and spending time in the Shire because um, I think it really helps steep you into um, just the beauty and idyllic nature of the place. And it makes um, the threat of, you know, the upcoming, you know, impending evil and the threat of like the dark riders feel you more real um, because you're just kind of like situated there and you've been in that space for a long time. Um, I also say ultimately like purpose, you know, world building that has purpose. Like this is speaking to a particular character or speaking to the story or kind of the grander themes of it. Um, I don't really like when I see like a piece of information is like, it's just there just to, you know, just for like the sake of the world, but not necessarily for the sake of the story. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, um, just going on, Lord of the Rings is so great because I'm thinking of like the world building um, in terms of the, even the lore and like the music um, and just all these different pieces that, yeah, I think like you say, that really build it up, but it just feels so kind of rich and enjoyable as you're going through it. Yeah. Um, another novel that I, um, that I also think of is um, Stranger in Alondria by Sophia Samatar. And in that she also uses, um, so use like his pieces of history, pieces of you know literature from the world, um, and of course like the the narrator who is in the in the story itself, he's actually crafting the language for his people. Um, they didn't have a written language before that, um, and so you feel a lot of like richness, um, a lot of descriptions of just like you know a very like very it's very descriptive of. Um, the setting but also of like people of things and I kind of like that as well that kind of sharp you know turn from like here's this you know jewel colored tree to like the readiness of someone's hair um kind of like I guess like that back and forth where it's like very descriptive you know sentences and places but it's not you know describing every rock and every you know like piece of everything yeah I mean I have different levels of world building that I, that I love. I mean, I love world building, but it depends on what I'm reading. And so I'm big on romance. And so when I read my romance, the world building is the last thing that's on my mind. Like, I don't, I don't want you to describe the world that these characters are in and stuff like that. I just want to know when they're going to fall in love, when they're going to kiss, when they're going to get their happily ever after. You know, I don't care whether it's set in Chicago or some like magical fantasy world. Like, I, I don't care. I just care about what's happening with the characters. But then, yeah, when I read my like fantasy and my sci-fi, my dystopian, everything like that, I want more world building than like character stuff usually. And my favorite author who does the world building that Josh is also going <laughs> to agree with is Sarah J. Maas. Like her, her Throne of Glass and her um, Court of Thorns and Roses and her new book that came out this year, Crescent City. That woman is like queen when it comes to world building. And it's world building that's like character driven and like plot driven. And it like spans her entire like series. Every single book you're learning something else about this world she's created. But it also like her earlier books, you'll see how things were like her foreshadowing and like these little clues she was like throwing in there about this world that when you get to like book number three or book number four or something, you're like, oh my God, you know, this was introduced in book one and I can't believe this is like where, where it ended, you know, that kind of thing. Oh yeah yeah no mass is definitely great um and i think she's interesting because like in fantasy she doesn't have the kind of surface complexity that i think something like game of thrones has where it's like this crazy like web of like very specific details mm -hmm. in quite the same way but i, I think exa you're exactly right kind of underlying that there is still so much going on there yeah. um and I think particularly in hers, um, dealing with like the, the hierarchies of like the fairy courts and the kind of the way the society runs is such a big part of mass, which I mean, yeah. is delightful to see it mm -hmm. unfold as time goes on. Yeah, and I think, I think the only way that she makes that work is that she spreads it out. Mm. You know, you don't just get it all at once and you're, cause I've, I've had those like books where it's just the first few chapters, it's just like, explaining everything you need to know about the world and it ends yeah. up like sometimes I'll even like I'll have to put it down because I'm like I have no idea what world this is or it'll be too much and like it'll turn me off from from wanting to read the rest of the story like I'd rather it you know explain it to me as part of the plot as part of the characters it'll just like dump it all at me all at once so that 
you can move on with your with your plot and stuff like that. But. Right, you, you get to like page thirty before there's a named character or dialogue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, those are. I was gonna say, yeah, those are like just never fun, you know. Again, like I feel like it, it, it only works if there's like a purpose. Like, why, why am I reading all of this? Like, what is this pointing back to? Like, what is this saying? You know. But if it's just there, just you know, for the sake of exploring the world, then it's just like, yeah, this feels like a waste of time. Yeah. yeah. And Nora, I like what you said too about um, like in the small details. Because I know, like sometimes when I'm writing a story, I feel like I have to explain this thing right now. Um, but then I go and I'll read a book and like I'm taking more time to recognize how much mm. I'm able to put together as a reader, mm. like out of those tiny details. Um, and I've read some books in particular where they, the authors very specifically don't explain a lot of things for a while. And like, I'm, I'm willing to sit there and be like, okay, like these characters are great. I'm interested in this plot. I, I trust that we're going to figure this out as we go. Um, and so it, it's been interesting recognizing kind of that difference between me writing and what I feel like I have to do versus me reading. And I'm like, okay, let's go. I'm in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Writer. Cause I mean, it's hard for some people to like when you're writers to like separate, you know, to be able to read a book as a reader and as a writer. Um, but I think as a writer, since you have it in your head, like you have it exactly like, you know, the color of the leaves and like, you know, how exactly the government works and everything, you kind of also want to just like dump it all there so the author, so the reader can picture it the same way you do. And I think that's where like, when you're writing it, you have to write it as if you were the reader, kind mm. of. And you know, if I read this myself, would I be overwhelmed? And like, that'll usually help, at least it'll help me at least to kind of be like, okay, wait, this was too much. They don't need to know all this, you know, all at once. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I've heard descriptions about how like the author needs to know all that because like you can kind of feel if an author hasn't done kind of the background work, um, the, like the world feels shallow, but then I, yeah, I think exactly like you're saying it, it's in the mind, but then it, it's not the page. It, it, it influences what's on the page without being there directly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, actually, I remember th this was talking about like research and historical accuracy. I think it was David Anthony Durham at Stone Coast um talked about doing like hours of research on horseshoeing i think it was horseshoeing and wrote was, wrote out this whole scene about it and i think his wife read it and was like what why is this here <laughs> yeah. um, and, it, and then that scene ended up becoming i think one line instead mm -hmm. but the important thing was that he had the information to write that line that he needed um yeah. and the point yeah it was that same thing of what actually needs to be on the page yeah i've talked so like josh and i we have this thing where we will like trade manuscripts and we'll, we have our weekly goals and stuff like that, that we like bounce back and forth. And there'll be times where I'll text him during the week and I'm like, I'm researching this and this and that for this like one single sentence. It's this like super tiny detail in the story that won't even matter usually, but like I need to make sure that that tiny detail will make sense, that it'll yeah. apply to the plot and it'll just be like this whole three hour research for like a six sentence, six word sentence. <laughs> no. the, the writing life. Yes. yes yeah I feel like I need more I need to do that more often because I feel like I there are times where I've jumped into a story and I'm like I know the story I know what I want to say with my characters and I do it and then um yeah the world doesn't make sense or the world is it there was um at Stone Coast in one of the workshops I had I've written a story which was um basically like Snow White but Black people in space and the and it was really and it was you know it was really fun and really interesting but people were like this could have taken place like anywhere like because there were just like no details about really like the like what it meant to live in space and on another planet and like you know and like so I, I feel like sometimes I need to actually stop and be like okay I need to research even if yeah even if it's going to just end up being one sentence or one you know paragraph um uh, because or else like the story just doesn't yeah, it's just like, why is this here? Like, it doesn't feel like it's here. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and sometimes I feel like those small details are really the things that make the story. Um, as brief as they are, they can really kind of set things apart from, mm -hmm. like you're saying, it, it can really ground um, the details. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
So I will say, um, just going off of um, authors, I recently read um, A.K. Larkwood's The Unspoken Name, um, which is a book where the, the world building in particular stood out to me. Um, Cause so, I mean, we've all read the fantasy novels where you open up and there's like the full map in the front. I love those. <laughs> right, no, I mean, maps are great. Um, I open, th this one um, looks as if it's like sketches on different pieces of paper almost like mm -hmm. pinned up on a board and then connected with like string. Mm -hmm. And so it's not one map, it's fragmented. Um, and then as you get into the story and the world she's creating, um, it's actually like this multiple set of worlds connected by this maze. And so they travel, they like are, go on like flying ships and they travel like through a gate into the maze, out into a different world. And then you travel to another gate in that world and then back into a different part of the maze and then out of that. And so it's all these interlinked worlds in this kind of fantasy universe. Um, and then like as worlds decay, they fall out of existence and are like pulled into the maze. Mm. And then there's like gods that live in caves and there's gods that are trapped in pillars. And so it, it has all this kind of richness that lifts up the story and just feels really different but all of it at the same time feels like important to the world and the story. Like it, it really, it doesn't always drive the plot, but it's, it, it feels fully realized. And I just remember going through that book, um, just being struck again and again with this world that she had created, wow. um, which was so much fun. Wow. I will say whenever I open a fantasy book and I see that map on like the first page, I get so excited. Cause I'm like, okay, this means that the author like planned this all. Like they, they did their research, you know, they created this whole, not just this little town that the book is set in, they created like their whole world. And that gets me like so excited <laughs> for the world building that's going to happen in that book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think going off of that, um, and I know we've kind of touched on this a little bit d depending on our genres, but um like how much thought do, do you give to world building or to setting as you're telling your story either initially or I think as you're going in like um do you bring that environment into the plot or is the is the environment more secondary to the other things that are happening I think uh for me it it happens like both can happen um I'll start with an idea or a story and then I think about, um, yeah, and then I'm like, okay, well, what does this mean? Like, what does this look like for this character? Um, what is the world, how does, um, what is the world that this character can live in look like? Um, and, and usually kind of building around from there. And um, lately I've been trying to be, trying to stick closer to, you know, what are important details that I need to work out for the story that I'm telling. Um, Cause I've gotten lost in, um, trying to figure out all of these like details of other things and I'm like okay well how can I fit this into the story like how can I fit you know the you know the political system that's happening into the story but I'm like the story is really not about you know the politics of the world that she that my character is living in um, and so kind of like scaling back and being like okay well what do I actually need to work out um, what do I need to figure out and then there are other times where the world will come to me um, like I, when I was much younger, I had written a whole, you know, sky pirate steampunk story thing. And like, I loved all the characters, but the world was pretty boring. It's not interesting. Um, and then, um, Assassin's Creed Origins, um, this video game that came out about like, maybe two years ago. Um, I loved it so much being able to see like Egypt and kind of exploring it. But I'm like, what if I took those characters and what if I, you know, put them in the context of, you know, kind of this you know, steampunk, you know, kind of like commit Egypt, you know. And so then it was about, okay, well, what does this world look like? And then the world started changing the characters. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have a character who's like, you know, she's kind of like a, you know, like she's a pharaoh, you know, what does that look like for her? And what does it mean for her to be considered a goddess? And, you know, um, and things like that, just kind of like, you know, looking at, well, how does this world, you know, like reflect and um, impose upon the characters that I have? Um, so that's kind of like, I'll, I'll do both depending on the story um yeah I mean so I write two very different things like contemporary romance and like YA fantasy so with my contemporary romance I need to know just basically the location whether it's going to be like a real city or I don't know like a mesh of like th this one book that I just finished writing it's not set in Chicago but it's kind of like Chicago 
but it's enough like I picked the city and I was like okay that's more or less what it's going to look like but that's all I need to really know but I need to make sure like I can't start writing my contemporary romance until I have at least a location like the city in my in my head mm. but that, I mean outside of that I don't need to kind of create that world because it's it's set in like real life um but with my YA fantasy I need to know everything <laughs> I need to like, I, I create my like book Bible and then start listing like the characters and like government and languages and what magic is going on and the people. Like I need everything laid out just so that like I'm, I don't surprise myself halfway through the book and then be like, crap, I have to go back and like weave this in there, you know? So I feel like if I know everything and ahead of time, I won't be surprised. I won't surprise myself while I'm writing, I don't know like the climax or something and it's like well crap <laughs> you know yeah yeah you know, uh, I've definitely had those moments like three quarters of the way through the book I realized something and I was like that should have been set up in chapter one <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so it's, it's different but... yeah and I, I know um Nora I think I, I I think my process is kind of similar to yours with like that kind of the, the feedback loop of various things mm. um where I generally go in with some sort of idea of what the setting is going to be. Um, but I know I've complained to Diane about this. I'm terrible at like the book Bible piece of things and like planning things out. And so I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. It'll stay in my head. And then like two hours later, the pieces are gone. <laughs> um, and, I mean, but, I used to do that, so, which is why I started the book Bible thing. Because yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, there's no way I'm going to forget that vital piece of my world. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, I forgot that vital piece of my world. So now I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it, it's led to interesting pieces, kind of like you were saying about um, as the story develops, realizing what things need to be kind of looped into it. Um, I know I've heard other authors talk about like the story they were telling involves like an in interlocked banking system. And so that speaks to a certain level of kind of technology and advancement in the world. Mm -hmm. or like a certain level of um, transportation that needs to be available. Um, and then even I think the idea of like, what is the economy or like, how are they making glass? Like if everyone's got glass windows, where is that coming from? Um, and there are things that may or may not um, influence the story, but as, as I think they come up, it, it keeps building out the world as you kind of put those pieces into it in different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, like I feel like having, yeah, I, I need to work out more of those details and then learn about, learn how I can infuse this in without it being like, here's the, you know, the glass making factory that's, you know, over here and, you know, somehow, you know, push my characters over there so I can write about that. Um, but yeah, like having that, yeah, that, that balance of like, here's the research, here's, you know, everything that I need to, you know, I need to understand um, so that I can put this, this and that here and it not, you know, like take the reader out and have, and have them question like the validity of this world. Right. Yeah, no, I, I've definitely run into that. Um, one of the stories I've, I've been working on is set in very much like a kind of a barren desert wasteland. And so, the, the, and it's a full city, so they subside uh, very obviously on a lot of trade mm. um, because they have to bring in things that they don't have. But then I've had to stop and think, and I don't have a full answer for this yet. I was like, <laughs> what do they have to offer in exchange for this trade? Like, like what is the resource that they are providing in exchange? And it's a, it's a project I've shelved for now for other reasons. But I was like, when I go back to it, like they need to have some reason to exist here. Otherwise everyone's packing up and moving because nobody's going to trade with them. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good point. <laughs> um, so Claire on Facebook was wondering, um, and this kind of goes off what we're saying, but um, genres um, have like rules and expectations um, that readers kind of go in expecting to have certain things met. Um, and so when you're writing, like, do you think about those rules um, in terms of the, the world building, like um, the, the experience and the setting that you're giving to your reader so that they walk away from the story happy versus the things that you can kind of break and it might be surprising, but it's not going to leave them upset necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the answer is yes. I mean, so again, in like romance, I don't know if there's a lot of expectation when it comes to world building, in, at least in contemporary romance, I'm sure in historical and, and other types of romance, there is. In contemporary, there's not. I mean, I've read contemporary romance novels where like, I have absolutely no idea where it took place. And I don't care. <laughs> I don't care because my, my characters overcame their obstacles and they got their happily ever after. That's that's all you care about, I think, in a contemporary romance. In my fantasy, it's like, yeah, if I don't get those descriptive details of the terrain and, I mean, if it's political, if, if I don't get how politics works and, again, how the currency and the language and all that, then I'm disappointed because it's like the, the fantasy, it's, it's a brand new world and you want to, like, submerge yourself completely in it. You want to know everything about that world. So I think it's, it takes me to like Harry Potter and like in Harry Potter, I remember growing up, I wanted to know absolutely everything. So it's like, if they had, if she hadn't been as descriptive as she had been with her world, because I think her world building was amazing. But if she hadn't been now knowing, I guess, what is expected of fantasy novels, I would have been disappointed after the fact because as a kid it was still it still would have been magical but after the fact it would have been like well we missed out on a lot of things like if you compare the books to the movies there's a lot of things that the movies world building wise didn't get to portray and it's disappointing now when I think about it even though I still love the movies <laughs> yeah I I definitely um think about I guess like a baseline of rules like for like yeah for fantasy you know like what like this has to make sense you know just be, like that's I guess that's the number one thing like this has to make sense like if this is like one of my fantasy novels takes place kind of like on um like basically like an island world or island nation um and it's like okay well what does this look like you know a lot of the people there are you know they're they're black and like okay like how do I infuse like you know p pieces of African-American culture into a fantasy world you know where it's not you know especially when it's not something that is you know usually experienced um in fantasy novels where like you know a lot of the times when it comes to seeing you know black people in fantasy um or what a lot of people do is you know they look to African culture they look to um or they you know create their own culture um you know and so like it's finding that sort of like middle ground of like what are pieces of my culture that I can imbue in here that will make sense and not, and not take the reader out but also things that um may feel you know like unusual but it's but how can I make it something that the reader can like digest and feel comfortable with um, especially language too because um that's another thing where you know I've definitely tried to avoid you know having you know like a very I guess very like standard English, you know, kind of like high fantasy typical like language um, with my characters because they like, yeah, just they wouldn't talk like that. It was like, how can I have this, you know, inside my novel in a way where it doesn't take the reader out, but it also, you know, challenges their perceptions of what they might expect coming to it. Yeah, it's kind of like a, ba a balancing act. And then with my other like other short stories that I've written where okay, this is basically like magical realism or kind of surrealist, you know. Um, this, I'm sorry, it sounds like there's like a parade happening outside. But um, yeah, with those short stories, um, you know, that's where I've, you know, like I've kind of played around with bending the rules a bit. Um, and there's a lot more leeway there anyway. Oh. Yeah, and I feel like, I mean, like we say in writing, the only rule is that there are no rules. Um, and I, I think that, genre does come with a lot of expectations but at the same time I can think back on a lot of those expectations and places where they've been broken successfully um and I think if you do it right there's very few things that you cannot get away with um like obviously romance needs the happily ever after like that is a requirement um generally considered yeah. if, if you don't I'm, get yeah, yeah. Um, and fantasy needs some sort of fantastic elements, but um, like I'm just saying in terms of world building, I've read like the eight, 900 page um, fantasy novels that have all of that rich, like the magic and the magic systems and the, the long standing history. 
Um, but then recently I know like Tor is putting out a lot of novellas. So you're, you're looking at 150, 200 pages um, in fantasy and sci-fi genres. And the, um, like some astounding work is being done in those that still I think feels as big in a lot of ways, but a lot, of, a lot more of it is kind of behind the scenes. Mm. Um, Cause I know, a lo- um, I think last summer I read, um, this is how you lose the time war which is um, like, it's a time war going up and down the strands of reality across like all these different things. And there's a technology-based society and like a plant-based society. And the whole thing I think is less than 200 pages. And so to to pack kind of all this into this Mm -hmm. very tight, intimate story, um, like I can certainly see an argument of coming in and being like, I want so much more out of this world. But at the same time, I don't feel like the story necessarily suffered at all for being that short because it achieved what it wanted to. Mm. And, so, and so I think that's kind of an interesting piece. Like, what are you setting out to achieve? And do you convey that successfully to the reader by the time you're done? Yeah. Which I, I feel like is probably easier said than done because <laughs> I can praise I can praise other people for it. And then I sit down at my own laptop and cry, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that is a really, you know, like a really, it's a really good challenge. Um, and I think it's great when authors meet it. Um, yeah. Where it's like, you know, what did you achieve what you were wanting to achieve with this? Um, yeah. And there definitely have been books I've, you know, I've read where I'm like, okay, like, I don't understand, you know, why all of this happened, you know, if this was just about this, you know, and even right. you know, things, even films, you know, where I watch, I'm like, okay, you know, you decided to show me this, this, and that, and now, but you're saying that it's about, you know, relationships or something when, you know, people are dying or people are, you know, yeah, like, it's, it, like, there'll be things that seem to juxtapose, ju- like, I guess, juxtaposition themselves, and then, um, because it didn't fully, it didn't achieve what you were, you know, or what the creator was trying to achieve, um, yeah, I think that's a challenge that everybody, really, like, faces. Yeah, and I think whenever you break those rules, there are going to be people that respond really well to it, and there are just there are going to be those people who are like, "No, I wanted it to go the way I was expecting. You did do that, and obviously that your story is terrible." Yeah. Um, and I mean th- that's going to happen no matter what. So, yeah, I remember um, not world building wise, but still like you know it's a rule where, especially in like dystopian or romance or something that you're protagonist your main character survives whatever war they like went through if your main character dies it's kind of like well what was the point of that and I remember when I read Divergent when um, Veronica Roth released that last novel that last novel made me like go through the five stages of grief it was like two weeks of like every time I thought of that last book I was like sobbing because spoiler but she killed off her protagonist like her hero she like killed her off and I was like no I refuse to accept this like this is not what you're supposed to do everyone else can die but your hero the one who like these last four books has been about and revolved around cannot die like it just can't happen and it was like I think it was gonna be like a month or so afterwards where I was like you know what I'm okay with it like I understand why she did it now but in the moment it was very much like no you just broke like the cardinal rule of like a dystopian like how do you kill off your main character type type of thing and I remember like she got a lot a lot of like criticism for it and I may have been one of those people that criticized her about it at first but in the end I was like I totally understand why she did it and like I approve even though it's like a rare ending because I still I haven't come across another book that ends that way but I was like I understand it, it's war and not everyone's going to survive war, even if it is the leader and, you know, the one that everyone's behind. That doesn't mean that they're going to automatically survive. So it was a shocking, shocking ending. But I appreciate it now as a writer, what she did. So. Yeah, well, I, I think that's the thing is that as writers, like we get so familiar with how stories are told that when we find those stories where like we know how this is going to end and then we get there and it doesn't what like that 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 moment of reveal can yeah. be so so great to be like i never knew that i did not see that coming 
like I wouldn't have had the guts to do that as a writer probably so yeah I always love when people when writers and um yeah when writers do that um and you see, and I love seeing the oh okay like I see why you did that like I see what you're saying like what you're saying with this like you know like we're like yeah that one thing that is like different or broken it's like oh like you're 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 saying something like you're making a statement about this um you know um or even to like the the sense or the feeling of like a, a character's story is finished you know like their story is finished or it's done they've had maybe sort of this like complete cycle um you know i mean the first thing i think about is like the walking dead um and just all the myriad of characters that die and mainly in like the, the middle of the series you know kind of like at its high point um you know and like all of these ev every character at that point you know died but their story had completed um like there were there was a sense of completion with like where their their whole like arc um and i love when that i love when that happens and i love when it happens like unexpectedly it's like okay you know like I, this is nice yeah. <laughs> then you have season eight of game of thrones that completely like botched it by killing like they killed their hero but completely botched it like i could have gone behind it if they had done it you know correctly and taken their time to introduce everything but yeah hopefully the books will be different but tv wise i i don't think that was yeah I they went for the cut without any like good reasoning behind it other than to just kind of like end it you know, so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I think that's the thing is like the difference between shock value versus good storytelling, um, I think comes up in a lot of ways. Um, and the, the, the storytelling and the world building, it has to be there, I think, from the beginning effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I and, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I hate shock value. Like, I, I hate that so much. Like, I, I, ser like, I seriously hate it because sometimes I feel like people will put you through things just for the sake of it. And I don't, yeah, I don't appreciate that. I don't like it, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think you get a, a similar issue with like the, the Duo Ex Machina endings where like somebody has this big epic ending plan but they haven't set it up at all in the story, in the world of the characters or whatever. And they get to the end like, oh, I, I, I love Tolkien but the Eagles save everybody again. Um, <laughs> like, it, some, sometimes it just kind of comes out of nowhere versus you get um, into other things and like you can watch all the like the threads kind of come together. Mm. Um, actually, I know like the, the Throne of Glass series, the last couple books, you're watching all these kind of different story threads start yeah. linking up at various points and it all leads to a climax that really serves the entire everything that came before. Yeah. I think I remember with Throne of Glass, I think it's is it seven books or something and book six, which was supposed to be a novella that took place, like the, the story in that book took place simultaneously to the previous book that came out. And I remember when she announced it was gonna be a full novel, I was like excited, but upset at the same time because I wasn't a big fan of the character it was in a center on, it wasn't gonna be based on the hero because these characters were like somewhere else while these things were happening. And like, after the fact, again, after the fact, it was like, okay, we needed that novel to tie in all these things. Otherwise that last book would have just been like, what? Like, when did this happen? How did this happen? Type of thing. Yeah. Um, so should you should things... read the Throne of Glass if you haven't, Nora. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll definitely check it out now. I haven't read it. <laughs> um, sh shifting just a little bit. Um, I was watching, uh, uh, author event recently, and um, Akwiki Amezi, who is a YA author, mm -hmm. um, they were they were talking about like in times of um, kind of social social upheaval and just like very difficult times, um, it, literature can and art in general can kind of seem like a strange thing to focus on, and so the the, the question the moderator was posing was effectively um, can art and can literature change the world. Um, and a, a quakey um, in their answer was saying that basically in, in order to do something different in the future, we first have to be able to imagine what that future is going to look like. Um, and um, they were saying that art is particularly well placed to let us imagine alternative futures. Um, 
And just in, in seeing that picture, then we have kind of something to aim for as we are making changes. Uh, and so just, um, especially right now with Black Lives Matter, the politics, the pandemic, like everything that 2020 has been up to this point. Um, I mean, just what do you think of that idea? Like the, the, the role of art kind of as we're moving forward and the role of artists in these conversations? Um, I think it's vitally important um, and incredibly impactful um, seeing like just engaging with art that reflects the time or even reflects the past because sometimes it's difficult to sometimes it's difficult to create art in the midst of um, just everything going on um, and it's also hard to see things you know like directly sometimes um, or see situations clearly when we're in the moment as opposed to when we're outside of it um, but I think um, I definitely believe that you know art and and literature can like reflect in such a way that allows us to approach um, approach issues, approach you know our own prejudices in ways that um, are much easier for us to engage with and digest. Um, you know, like I think all the time about like um, just novels, like especially in like speculative fiction, where like you can put something in a different world or you know a different context um, and address social issues, and um, the reader can accept it and take it in, as opposed to just saying you know, war is bad, you know, or just writing a manifesto about that. It's like, no, let me actually tell you a story, um, you know, where, you know, this is the con the consequences of war. This is, you know, these are the people that go to war. This is, you know, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's incredibly important. And I think it helps people um, understand things and perceive. Um, I know for me personally, um, just like on like literature and its impact and how it can teach you about the world, I remember the first time I learned about the Holocaust. Um, I was in elementary school and I hadn't, they hadn't taught about it yet, um, but there was a book called Devil's Arithmetic on the reading list. And um, it was, I just picked it up. You know, I didn't really know what it was about. And then I read it and I was like, wow, like this was real, you know? And then my mom, she went and like got a documentary of Diary of Anne Frank. And that's kind of just like how I learned about the Holocaust just before anybody had really like taught me about it or said anything about it. Um, but it was through the door of literature and art because it was literature plus, you know, a film um, that allowed me to learn about this. Um, so I think it's, it's vitally important. Um, yeah, in these times. Yeah, everything that Nora said. And um, I remember growing up, um, not within my family, but like society as a whole, I remember always being told that like, your, your elders know what's best for you. Like you don't question your elders and stuff like that. And I remember, I mean, that, that whole dystopian like diversion and Hunger Games and Harry Potter, like that whole craze. And I know Gen Z is a part of it too. And I remember reading those books and I was like, oh my God, like these people are my age and like, look at what they're doing. Like they're, they're questioning like how, oh my God, they're questioning their elders. Like, and I think it's taught a lot. I've seen a lot of videos recently with, everything that's been going on of, of like Gen Zers mostly being like we we speak out we know how to like speak out and you know say what our thoughts are because of these books that that we've read that taught us that it's okay for us to stand up and you know we may be teenagers we might not be able to vote but we can tell people our opinions and like what we want and it'll make change because it's happened in the books and I think a lot of the teenagers have like taken that to heart as we see, I mean, Greta and like all these teenagers being part of protests and climate change and everything, the majority of those things are being led by people in their teens who normally like I, I never would have been outspoken or gone against an elder or like the president or governor or anything like that because it was like they know better, you know? So I think like and on, in that aspect, that art and like literature can really help teenagers you know open their minds and realize that their opinion matters even if they're they're young yeah I think yeah. also oh no go ahead well I, I was just gonna say um yeah I think that like just looking at how art um either reinforces or challenges the things that are considered normal um so what, whether that's like you're saying kind of the big social rules of um 
like youth and gender and all these different things, um, literature, I think, can rest in those and kind of portray them as they are. Or it can kind of shake things up and be like, what if teenagers are the ones that have to save the world? Yeah. Um, or what if like we did things differently? I know sci-fi does that um, in particular very well. It's like, what if we made this one little change? What would be kind of the, the, the effects of that down the line? Yeah, um, I think also um, there's also this very important a piece of looking at it like honestly um, because that's something that has happened um, in the past where it's like, oh, what if, you know, there was no war and it's a utopia, but you don't see any Black people, you don't see any minorities reflected um, because this is this person's like worldview, you know, where it's like, oh, this is a very, you know, a, a white male-centered worldview. Um, and and I think we're seeing, you know, like a, we're seeing a challenge to that and also a reckoning for, you know, allowing other voices to come into play. Um, because when that worldview is, you know, basically like majority, um, that also influences us in the present, you know, where we think, oh, this is the norm, you know, like this, you know, this understanding of the world, what the world looks like, you know, who is actually important, who, you know, who's, um, whose life do we pattern ourselves after? Um, it's affected by, you know, what we see, what we read, what we engage with. Um, so I think, yeah, like the, the I guess the reinforcing um, can also be something that's, you know, that's I guess negative and it's something that we're really we're feeling the ramifications of now um, as well in like just like the call to having more you know minority voices telling their own stories and speaking as well to like their own communities so that there is a more of a well-rounded understanding um, of these things. Yeah and I know kind of along with that as well like as much as literature is a force or can be a force for change um, I think one of the other important pieces is just how it's a uh, comfort as well um, especially like in the middle of a pandemic and um, just with everything going on I, I know for me sometimes I just like I want to go sit down with a happy book and yeah. just like settle into that for a while and even even if it isn't overtly political or anything like that like that is just as important because it those stories kind of help us keep moving forward and give us that place to rest and escape to um, which is I think vital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, I've been engaging with, I mean, not necessarily, I mean, not comforting, but I guess because it's, you know, like, it's like typical TV, like I've been watching a lot of like Law and Order SVU, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting now, you know, in these, in, you know, like in discussing, you know, police and their, you know, presence in society, even how they're depicted, but even just engaging with that, where it's like, you know, this is something that's not, you know, like, you know, it, it can be heavy, but not that heavy because it's, you know, it's TV. Um, but it's like, okay, like I can kind of just watch this and watch this episode and watch that episode and kind of like be on, you know, I guess like the being in the surface level of it or being like get to something that's like not as, you know, something that doesn't draw you in so much kind of like helps me, you know, kind of like alleviate some of the stress. Yeah, well, and I think too, um, I know I've heard this for like procedurals and sometimes true crime and horror. Um, is that it's kind of a way to process through some of those feelings with that distance, I think, like you're saying, mm. um, where like you can watch other people go through it. And then at the end, typically, like the bad guy, the evil, whatever is defeated. Um, and so like th there's that that catharsis and that release through um, stories that we don't always get in reality. Mm. Um, which I mean could spark into a whole other conversation, but I, I I feel like that's definitely a part of it as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes yeah, because yeah, and it's the whole you know like the um, the formula too. You know, just like okay, like this is it. This is the crime, and then the the person is caught or whatever you know, or the truth is revealed at the end, and everything is like resolved. Um, yeah, I even started like a um, or even like engaging with romance again, you know, like being in that space of like the formula of like, you know, the hero and the heroine and falling in love, you know, and there's like, you know, a happy ending or a resolution or, you know, um, it, yeah, it feels good being in that, um, that space. You get that closure that you might not be getting in, in real life. So it's like, yeah, I got it. Um, so one last question, just to kind of wrap it up, um, and we'll broaden this out from world building, 
Um, but just in terms of stories, what is something you've read, watched, played, seen, listened to, anything um, just recently that you, you've really enjoyed? Uh, a book, a TV show? Um, well, I don't know. Well, my the last season of one of my favorite shows, The 100, started, I think, a few weeks ago. So I love, I've been enjoying that. And I got Josh to start it a couple weeks ago too. So it's going to take a while to catch up. But yes. um, as far as TV, I think it was like the 100 of, of knowing that it's like almost over. And I just want to see how the stories of these characters from, that I've been watching for like the past six years um, are going to end. And book wise, I think it was, it was book two of a series by Jennifer Armantrout, who's one of my favorite um, writers as well. And it's, it's like a spin-off of a spin-off of a spin-off. And so I just, I mean, I just love it because it's like, I'm in the same world, but with different characters, but I've known that world for like, I don't know, eight years maybe or something like that. So that, those have been my two big ones that like have brought me happiness completely. Um, for me, there's, there's been a couple of things. Um... I mean, this was like a month ago, but like I, I saw Parasite and that was like amazing. Like yeah. I was like, wow, like this, yeah, it was an amazing film. I, I loved it. Um, and I was a, like, I was surprised because of how, I'm always surprised whenever like a story can kind of like really like suck me in and it doesn't feel, you don't feel the time. You know, yeah. and I felt like that with Parasite, where I'm like, you were like, you were in the story, you're moving along with the characters. Um, and yeah, and it was just a powerful, yeah, it's a powerful film. Um, and then recently, um, this isn't a film, but it's a trailer um, for Candyman. Um, Mia Da Costa released um, one about about two weeks ago, and it's like a shadow puppet. Um, it's a shadow puppet like trailer, and it depicts all of these, you know. Like black people have been, you know, like you know, wrongfully like killed or arrested, you know, throughout time, and like in Candyman story is in there as well, and it's like it's beautiful and it's like haunting and it and it really captures like a lot of like the the horror and sadness that exists in our history, but in, yeah, and just being able to depict it in this way um, and connect it to this, you know, like horror film, um, I really enjoyed. Um, and I'm also been as far as like reading. Um, I've been reading uh, the annotated African American folktales um, anthology that was done by Henry Louis Gates and Maria Tatar, and that's been incredibly informative on um, just learning about like black, you know, just like African American folktales, what that looks like, how that informs like um, our history and my personal history. Um, yeah, and being like, oh, how can I as a writer kind of go into this and you know, like kind of like you know, express myself or express like the, the stories I want to tell, you know, through the lens of, you know, folklore. Um, yeah, that's basically, it's American, but it's, it's the, it's the black experience here. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been like, I guess the things that I've, I've been engaging with lately. Yeah. As well as Animal Crossing. Yes. Um, well, I know for me, um, I recently read, um, I keep talking about this, like everywhere I go, um, Tochi Onyabuchi's book, Riot Baby. Um, which is like sci-fi superheroes plus dealing with um, racism and police brutality. Mm. Um, and that's another one that is so short. And that book is just like impactful from page one. Um, and it's just, he, he delivers the story. Um, it's really of two siblings, um, just with so much depth in such a short span. Um, so that one was really good. And so I'm reading through um, some of his YA books now just because I'm hooked and I'm going to go through the, kind of the back catalog. Um, and then outside of that, um, so I, I know that there have been mixed reviews for um, gamers, but I'm playing through on um, The Last of Us Part Two right now. Oh my gosh. Um, which I have to say for me, I'm, I'm hooked. I, I loved the first one. I love these characters. And for an emotional experience of storytelling and world building. Um, I, I'm still part way through it, but it's been delightful as much as a depressing post-apocalyptic wasteland can be. Yes, we, we just, me and my husband just finished playing through it. And it's, we, I mean, we have different, we have, yeah. I've had some issues with the story. Um, not, it's not the criticisms that are kind of like dominating right now, 
but but I've had some some concerns. About yeah, I, I, I'm I'm reserving judgment till I finish, but so far it's been great. Great, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, yes, that brings us almost to four, so uh, we can wrap it up here. Um, Nora, thank you for joining us. Um, Diane, thanks for jumping on to my crazy idea to do video discussions. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, and for anyone who is viewing, this will be up on Facebook after we're done, and it will be on my YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch the whole thing if you missed any of it. Um, feel free to share it with anybody else, and we will be back um, at some point in the future with another guest and another conversation. Um, I'm hoping to keep this going for a while, so it should be fun, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. <laughs>